So you referenced before that you were in Tahrir Square. What it made me think was that there was a point not that long ago, and you might not have been part of this chorus, but there was a sense that, hey, social media is going to make uh, democracy flourish all over the place because it's very hard to maintain a repressive regime when everyone can have, have access to things and organize. And then people came together uh, in the Arab Spring and toppled various governments and were like, wow, like democracy is going to bloom. Uh, and then that naivete essentially went uh, poof, like uh, a <laughs> puff of smoke, like uh, the weeks and months that followed where in many ways uh, authoritarianism benefited somehow. A lot of the technology-enabled dynamics did not improve things. Did you see that coming? Like, were you someone who was like, hey, you know, this entire facile notion that more internet equals more democracy is not going to work out like people are hoping? I, I called bullshit on that from the start. Um, and the reason why is because there was a narrative that I consider neo-colonial, which is that our tools liberate you, right? And I knew fully well, and we know fully well that, you know, obviously this is great as a sort of branding campaign for Silicon Valley, but we knew even at that time that, te- that you know, various types of quote unquote personalization algorithms were sending us into echo chambers and, you know, these kinds of, these kinds of terms were known at the time, and some of my colleagues like Eli Pariser had done work on that subject. So I, the reason I went out there was I was super interested, A, in that narrative, and B, trying to actually not debunk it, but try to understand in a real way what contribution, if any, are these technology platforms having in this massive social movement, in this revolution. And, and what I quickly realized it was it wasn't that it's not technologies that contribute to social change. It's what people do with them that contributes to social change. So in, in Tahrir at that time, in Egypt at that time, less about 5% or less like robust internet connectivity, 1% or so of social media connectivity. Those that were connected to those networks were more demographically homogenous, upper middle class, generally liberal, um, more educated. It turned out also the Ikhwan or the Muslim Brotherhood also had robust connectivity and were really the only organized form of resistance to the hegemony of the state. Um, And then there was a very robust labor movement. So what I did is I pivoted around. I interviewed a lot of pretty radical Islamists, Ikhwan people. I can kind of blend in and out of things pretty easily. Um, People super leftist, this and that. And I tried to look at what were their technological practices. And here's what I found out people were realizing they could use social media to influence journalism. They could influence journalists by basically posting particular kinds of content on platforms and getting that content not just globalized in terms of having people like see what's going on around the world, but also influence people within their own country. Journalists in their own country are are looking at what these people are posting on social media and remediating it or what we call a media ecology, broadcasting it back onto satellite TV, because that's what everybody had at that time. And that was true in a lot of the Middle East and in India, where I'm, my family's from. That, that, that's a fantastic feedback loop that they discovered. Exactly. They're like, hey, you know what we can get? We can get media coverage. <laughs> exactly. We can hustle this. So I was interviewing people like Ayman Moheldin. You might know him because he's now a MSNBC anchor, but he was like the man, Al Jazeera English uh, out there. And I was looking at what all, what Ayman was sourcing on Twitter, who he was following on Twitter, and he was he was strategically following certain kinds of activists who were putting stuff out. And here's the other cool thing that I saw: people were pulling things off of on online media, like platforms like YouTube, and projecting it in public spaces. I saw that all around the country. So that had another kind of circulation of online offline. And the reason why that was important was that could actually bring people together to look at some of the documentation of what was going on, some of which was manipulated content, by the way, very propagandist. And people would look at these things and they would just rile them up. So of course, blind technological connectivity in a sense can disincentivize collective action, but certain forms of technological connectivity combined with the use, the, the brilliance of activists who understand their own country, their own limitations, their own constraints, uh, can make a huge change. And so that was really interesting to look at because Occupy happened right after that. And I was also studying Occupy afterward. Yeah, you were right, right there at the crux of history. It's wild. Around the same time, there was a similar naive belief that now we have seen fail, uh, which is that 
The internet was going to connect us all to the sum total of human knowledge and thus make everyone smarter, more enlightened. There'd be new works of genius because you, you'd be able to access everything at your fingertips. Uh, fast forward a number of years, and it feels like, if anything, we've gotten baser, dumber, more misinformed, more angry and inflamed. Is this also something that you kind of saw coming? Uh, I was with my friend Tristan Harris uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he called it the race down the brainstem uh, because that's the way a lot of these social media platforms uh, operate. Uh, was, was this something that you were concerned about? I've heard Tristan talk about that, and I've talked to him about that as well. Um, yeah, it is because of two major reasons. Well, first of all, on the kind of democratic global level, uh, we never really had that global village because not everyone from the globe was participating equally, not just with access, but also in, in content that was being put out. You know, Wikipedia at a certain point in time, and I love Wikipedia, 95% of its uh, editors and primary authors were male and, and from the Western world, North America, Canada, Europe, and so on. So that speaks to how even an amazing, uh, you know, kind of uh, technology like Wikipedia uh, is actually highly asymmetric in terms of who drives its content. But I really, what we really saw was when this whole personalization thing came up, right? So the way Google functioned is it used a, it, an algorithm which we call PageRank, which basically said, if we're going to rank a bunch of Andrew Yangs with one another, we're going to pick the Andrew Yang that has the most backlinks linked to it. So it was based on domain-based knowledge. What the, 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 the epistemological claim was information that's most credible is most socially validated or socially linked to. So if you notice, none of that involves spying on people, right? None of that involved what, but, but then what happened is personalization became more about Googling us or socializing us on Facebook, right? Like, it, are we Googling or being Googled? Are we socializing or being socialized? Are we using technology or being used, right? There's a sort of dyadic relationship that is unexpressed and under discussed still to this day. So when they started doing this personalization stuff, what happened is we became Googled and we became Googled not based on sort of a sort of a, some sort of neutral notion of relevance, but based on what would grab our attention. And the way that works, which I think is really interesting, is it's all based on correlation. So, you know, if, if you, Andrew Yang, have looked at, you know, a million web pages and I have all this data about your engagement on those different web pages, which we call documents in the information sciences, and then I have very similar profile to you, it will recommend content to me based on correlation mapping. It doesn't actually know what content is inflammatory or sensational because we've never really done good AI work yet to that extent, I believe, in text mining. So I'm being nerdy here, but, you know. But Please, all, no, dig in. So um, all so it, it can't tell whether it's inflammatory, but it can tell what I'm going to like. Is that a, a fair? Precisely. And what is going to activate and maximize my attention? And we know through and through, and Tristan talks about this, that what maximizes that dopamine release and that cortisol release is outrageous content. We like to, you know, we don't like to get outraged, but when we see the former- But we do. <laughs> we don't like to be outraged, but we kind of do. We kind of do in this country. And the other really interesting point that I just want to make, you know, again, slightly philosophical bent, is what's being fed to us online, which is, you know, in our present world, and which will likely shape our future in many ways is all based on the past. I think that's really important to point out, right? That our lives are being directed digitally based on past data of which we know nothing about. We don't know what data is collected about us by whom, how it's being monetized, none of it. But imagine, right, Andrew, if your past is like over-determining of who you become, right? To me, that's a violation of humanism itself. So what you're describing is why when you Google something and I Google something, we can get different results. Even if we're demographically very similar, even if we're politically very similar, it's no longer about that. It's about the data body. That's the term we use in engineering. We call it a data body, uh, which is sort of like it's a triangulation of all these different kinds of data points, including data that might not even be gathered again by me on my phone or me intentionally, it might be data gathered about me when I'm walking right down the street and I see that Amazon uh, vehicle right out there because those all have surveillance cameras, external surveillance cameras. Yeah, they can get us in the real world too every once in a while. Or we'll do something that says, hey, um, I, I used Apple Pay 
um, at this storefront. So it's like, oh, I know he was there. I know that there, there's like a, you know, a buying pattern that, that starts developing. 